this over to Emily. All right. All right, welcome everyone. Um, we have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in so we can leave sufficient time at the end to answer your questions. Um, and while I demonstrate Arctos data entry and bulk loading, Teresa will answer your, any pressing questions that come up in the chat. Uh, so essentially, there are two ways to move specimen data into Arctos. The first method is through a conventional data entry screen with various types of text fields and drop down menu options. Typically, users will choose this method for one-off data entry records or when entering small batches of records. Um, and this form is also useful with operators that may be unfamiliar with spreadsheets or who work best in a data screen environment, such as students, new operators, and volunteers. Um, the second point, entry point for moving records into Arctos is through a process called bulk loading, which is essentially importing data from a spreadsheet into the database. Uh, and this method is often preferable and more efficient for migrating large numbers of records into Arctos, as well as for moving records that are already formatted in a spreadsheet into the database. So say, for example, from a researcher who's donating their recent field collection who has their data already prepared in Excel. Um, so first, let's look at the data entry screen to familiarize you with the different fields and menu options and walk you through inputting specimen data um, I'm going to spend a good chunk of time on this as it really lays out the foundation for bulk loading. And after that, we'll review how to bulk load data from spreadsheets. So to navigate to the data entry screen, you need to log in um, and go to the Enter Data tab, select Data Entry. You'll then come to a landing screen that offers several options. So you'll use this Begin At menu. Um, and I will zoom this in in a second. Um, but based on your operator permissions, you'll see a listing of the collections that you have access to. Here I have permissions for all of our vertebrate collections at CU, but this is a customizable feature, so you can grant different levels of access for students or staff so that they may be limited to specific collections and not others. I'm going to enter a bird record, and I can either enter a new record um, or start where I last left off. Um, if I pause mid-entry, I want to carry over data from my last record. So I'm going to click on this, enter a new date bird record, and this will take me to the data entry screen, which will have fields universally used across disciplines, as well as sort of customized drop-down menus and pick lists that are relevant to bird collections. Um, so before I zoom in, there are a few general things I want to point out on this screen before we take a closer look. Um, so these buttons all along the top, um, they all relate to the general display settings of the data entry form. So under Customize, I can indicate which fields I'd like to hide. Um, so say I know that I will rarely exceed entering more than five specimen parts in a record. I can hide you know, all these remaining rows from being displayed. I can also scroll down here and indicate um, which fields I'd like to carry over if I'm entering a sequence of records that will all share similar pieces of data to save me from re-entering repeated values by selecting this carry, um, and which fields to reset to null by clicking show. Um, all of the date fields have you know, little calendars, if an, and if I don't like this feature, I can click Disable Calendar so I don't have to see them. Um, these next few buttons are the sorting, um, refer to sorting the different data blocks here on the screen. So right now they're set to a default layout, but I can also click this Enable Sortable, which allows me to alter the physical layout of the data entry form. Um, by dragging and dropping each data block in the order that works best for my workflow. So here I have my form set to follow the order of our prep catalog and ledger columns to make data entry more efficient for operators. So if I were to click, click Reset Default Sort, that would restore my original form. Um, all fields highlighted in yellow are required, while all white fields are optional on the form. Um, and many of these fields have a controlled vocabulary versus a free text entry. So being a relational, highly normalized database, a controlled vocabulary ensures that values in Arctos are consistent from one operator or one institution to the next. So values such as um, people and institution names, taxonomy, and geographic terms are connected to tables rather than formatted as free text fields. 
so that the same value isn't entered in 10 different ways, essentially creating near duplicate and um, duplicate values and muddying up the database. Um, and one last thing before we review each field. So as you move through the data entry form, you can always click on the documentation links here um, to read more about each table and the types of data that should be entered, which I highly recommend if you're new to Arctos. Um, so these will be far more detailed than I'm going to go into now. Um, but for instance, I just clicked on identifications and I can scroll down here. I can look at um, different code tables associated with with um, each field, and that's going to show, you know, different definitions um, of your drop-down values, um, which are also very, which are helpful to know. Um, you can also navigate to the code tables via the search menu um, and click here, and that's going to bring up those definitions. I don't think I just showed that. Um, let me find an example here. Yeah, so if I click code table, it'll show me the definition and the different field names. Okay. So Arctos uses Darwin Core and Audubon Core vocabularies for field names, and the values available on the pick list are determined through a community consensus process, and we're adding new options frequently. So if there's something you need on the pick list that you're not seeing, you can always request that it be added. All right, so let me zoom in, close these out. I'm going to zoom in on the screen here, um, and it will make the format a little wonky. I apologize, um, but it's just easier for you to see. This is Erica. I just wanted to chime in real quick. If people can put in the chat, if they can let us know if you if this is not zoomed in enough, if you're having trouble reading the screen. Yeah, definitely. OK, so first you'll see my collection is already populated bird. Um, this first field is for catalog number, so there I would enter the catalog number. Um, I could alternately leave this field blank uh, to have the app application auto-populate with the next available number for that collection. Hey, um, Emily, could you zoom in a, maybe two more times? Sure. Is that good? That looks good. Thanks. Um, this next field, custom ID type, uh, refers to this other identifiers table right below, um, but essentially it makes it easy if you have an, another single other number besides catalog numbers like collector number or field number to enter it here, um, especially if you'd like to auto increment, um, which you can do if you're entering a batch of records by selecting the checkbox. This is the accession field, um, and this is the first of our controlled fields. Uh, and you'll see that since it's yellow, it is required. So I can pick an existing number that I have saved in Arctos using the pick list. So if I just either click pick or push tab, um, I can grab that number. And note that I actually can pick um, accessions across disciplines. So maybe this bird came from a mixed donation of salvaged animals. And so if I just click that, it'll populate. Um, but if it's a recently accession bird and I haven't set up an accession in Arctos, I'll have to do that. Um, which I'll go to manage data um, and transactions create accession. Um, and rather than navigating away from this page, I'll just open a new tab like so. Um, and this will bring me to a create accession page where I can fill out all the fields. So like data entry, all the yellow fields are required. I'll fill in all the relevant information, so the donation do date, the donor, nature of material, the count, and then I'll save my new accession. And um, my new accession number would be immediately available in data entry where I to then um, look it up on this pick list. I typically try to make sure that I have the accession record already created before I start entering data to make entering records more efficient. The same goes for other controlled fields such as um, agents, taxonomy, and higher geography so that I don't have to disrupt my data entry quite as much as I move along. Um, okay, the next block is other IDs. And this is 
the table where, where you'll enter all other identifiers related to the specimen then catalog number. So you can see on this list there's things like collector number, field number, lots of institutions, fish and wildlife identifiers, trap numbers, all sorts of options. Um, so, you know, here I could, I could pick something, um, you know, enter a value, and the relationship you'll see is defaulted to self for unique identifiers that pertain only to that specimen, but you can also indicate how this number is related to other specimens through the relationship menu. So, say that this bird was collected with its mate or has a parasite, and these are associated records that are also in Arctos. Um, I can show this relationship by selecting it on the menu. Um, and once loaded, this record will actually have a hyperlink to the specimen indicated. So just for an example, um, this is a, a lynx in our mammal collection that has parasites um, associated with the Museum of Southwestern Biology. So you can see here um, the links to MSB and the relationship type of host. Um, likewise, MSB has a parasite record with reciprocal links to our record here at CU. So you can see that relationships are not necessarily limited to within institutions they can reach across. Um, and we have many institutions listed in the drop-down menu. Um, so if the, that institution was an Arctos member, a hyperlink will automatically appear connecting the two records. Um, but if that institution isn't an Arctos, the identifier will simply display as plain text. Um, similarly, we also link out to GenBank. Um, so if I were to select here and enter a GenBank accession number, um, you'll see I can have that populated in a record um, and show under identifier. So if I actually click that, it will make a link out to NCBI um, and link to the corresponding sequence data. So it's kind of a neat feature. All right. So um, next we have the agents data block here. And um, agents in Arctos are people or institutions, organizations. Um, so you can, you can select collector, preparator, or maker as the agent type. And you can enter, um, you can see up to five agents. Once the record's actually loaded, you can append even more names if necessary. So I'll just start typing all or part of the name I want to enter. So say I got this bird. I'll just push tab to bring up, um, actually, I'll just enter part of my name. Um, I'll push tab to bring up, you know, any name that's, that corresponds with what I just entered, and I'll click on my name to populate that field. Um, as with accessions, if the name is not already in the pick list, you'll have to create a new agent profile. Again, I suggest opening a new tab. Um, so here, let me zoom out. I have... Um, this is, we're in the Create Agents tab here, so Agents, um, Create New Agent. But essentially, um, you can create a, a new person record, but before doing so, I, um, I suggest doing sort of due diligence and looking up the last name of an agent um, just to make sure that you're not sort of creating any duplicate or iterative profiles. Um, so I'm just, so if I were to search and look up breaker, I'll see a few other breakers in here. Um, I can click on my name and then see my profile. So that's going to have my name, my um, different iterations of my name, maybe any familial or academic relationships, any correspondence addresses, and my activity. So that's going to have um, sort of summarizes the specimen, citations, media, transactions that's tied to my name. So anyway, um, my name is already in the system, so I get the green light here in this, this field. Um, and I can actually click on this copy to all, which, which will push my agent name into other fields um, to save me from retyping this name over and over, if that's helpful as a shortcut. Um, next is the identification table. Um, which taxonomy sort of is also a controlled field. So um, I will start typing the scientific name and select it from a pick list. So here, and let's say I collected an olive-sided flycatcher. So I can just start typing in part of the name. Um, 
and you'll see you know a big table with lots of different options I can pick from. Um, this table pulls from Global Names, which is a web service that collates names from many recognized taxonomic authorities and checklists across disciplines, so such as like ITIS, WORMS, AOU, EOL. So there, um, there are lots of names already populated in there. Um, there's also many synonyms and unaccepted names available in the table. So if you're entering a legacy specimen, that can be useful. Um, Occasionally, you may need to enter a new taxon name, um, and again, you would have to open a new tab to do so. I'm not going to go too far into this since there will be a future webinar covering taxonomy, um, but essentially, you would use this taxonomy menu here <clears throat> and search for a, si a similar scientific name to clone the classification hierarchy to create the new taxon and essentially modify that cloned information to meet my new species name parameters. Um, and again, upon saving, that new name will be available immediately on the pick list to use. Um, also in identifications, you can let me zoom in a little bit. Sorry, sorry I forgot to do that. Um, you can click on this build button. Uh -oh. Sorry, I think my zooming out is affecting this build. Yeah, it's coming up somewhere. Oh, here we go. All right, so um, you can click on the build button um, to indicate sort of hybrid des designations, uncertainties, affinities, um, SPA and sub-SPA determinations, um, and even informal um, IDs, so like new species A. So this is a field that can accommodate both formal and flexible IDs, and I can, you know, build um, hybrids by typing the second name there, etc., and that will populate to this field. <clears throat> you can also enter higher level determinations than specific epithets. So here I know my bird species, but say I have an insect and I only have a family level determination until the specimen gets processed. Um, I may just enter a family level ID. Arctos displays the determination history in each specimen record, um, so it can reflect a, refl a refining of an identification as well as synonymies and changing taxonomy over time. Um, so all IDs can be captured and, and searchable. Um, identified by, so I've already pushed my name into this field using that copy to all button, but you can enter a different name for a determiner if someone other than the collector identified the specimen. Uh, nature of ID is just the basis of its determination. So this is a drop-down menu, uh, so you can select if it was maybe a preliminary field ID or based on molecular evidence um, or a legacy determination examined by an expert, etc. Um, hey, and then Emily, okay. sorry to interrupt. Oh. Can we zoom back in a couple levels? Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Just, I know it's confusing for you. I'm going in and out. Uh-oh. How's that? That looks great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. So date, um, again, this is, you can use the calendar um, or just type the date um, in the ISO, ISO format of year, 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 month, month, day, day. Um, and again, I can use this copy to all button to populate um, my other date fields as a shortcut. Um, and then ID remarks is whatever you need to enter, maybe a taxonomic reference or key used to make a determination or the specific sequence extracted from molecular IDs, um, any race or clade remarks, etc. cetera. Um, next is my attribute table. Um, and biological attributes are highly customized to the collection type. So here I'm entering bird data, but if I were entering, you know, invertebrate information, you know, the sex field isn't going to be highlighted as a required field. Um, so you can see here, I'll just mark this as a female, um, but you can see here there's lots of um, different attributes uh, related to birds. Um, some are going to have uh, related drop-down menus. Some will just be open text fields, say for a measurement, so I can fill that out. Um, 
And just be aware that if you do enter an attribute, determiner and date fields are conditionally required, even though they don't turn yellow when you activate the attribute. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, and you can also enter a method or, or remarks you have for each of these. And um, also with attributes, determiner is often the preparator, which may or may not be the same as the collector and collect date. So here you can use this little sync feature um, to populate only the attribute fields with preparator info if it differs from your agent one. So say one of our students just prepared this bird. I can look her up and then I can sync her name and we'll say she prepared she prepared the bird today and we can sync that up and and don't worry if there's extra um, you know lines here those those won't throw an error if you don't have attribute information there next is the parts table and parts are what actually comprise your specimen so this is a controlled vocabulary consisting of the part and often its preparation type so I'm going to enter a bird as a skin and I'm going to push tab and you can see here um, all the different options. So mine is a study skin. Um, this is a good place to look at the code table to see all the available options when you're first starting out in Arctos. Um, there's lots of different part types. Um, next you'll enter condition remarks, so good, fair, poor, and fragments, etc. Um, the disposition, so it's in collection, it's in hand, but um, once loaded this disposition can be updated to you know, on loan or exchanged, discarded, missing, deaccessioned, etc. Um, and then the count. So I have one. Um, I can scan my barcode or um, enter the label associated with my barcode to call it up if I'm barcoding this animal. Um, and any further remarks. Um, and parts are an itemized list with values broken out into this, these separate lines. Um, so. I'll just do, um, I have a, I say I took a spread wing, so I'll just push wing um, and add that information. Uh, and also say I took a tissue, I can add that. Um, we freeze them here, I see you. And you know, obviously I can go um, a, a lot further into condition, but for purposes of this demonstration, we'll keep it simple. And I'll just specify this as muscle. Um, and I don't have my barcode scanner right now, but for tissues, I would scan in my barcode here. Um, but this itemization is useful for indicating all the distinct parts that are associated with the specimen. So for instance, when creating loans, this allows you to select the specific part being loaned rather than having the entire record flagged as on loan, um, or even create subsamples if doing destructive sampling, like taking a skin clip from the study skin. Um, you know, and since my parts from the same individual may be physically stored in separate places throughout the collection, you know, my tissues in the freezer, my specimens in a cabinet, I can track storage locations of each part separately, and then they get all resolved and displayed together in the specimen record. Right. Um, next we have what we, refer, we, we refer to as the place time stack. Um, and this is sort of where you enter all the information related to the collecting event. Um, so if you're entering data for a locality uh, that you want to continue to reference, so say a field site that you return to often, you may want to just give it a nickname in order to easily call it up in the future. Again, this is optional. Um, if your specimen was actually collected at the same time and place as an existing specimen record in Arctos, you can use this pick event field to query that event and all the fields um, will auto populate with the specific event info to easily create a clone of this a, a, of an existing event so I can you know search for a, a very detailed query of mix of island and um, coordinates to find a very specific event that's already exists in Arctos um, and we're, if I were to find the match, I can click on that and just auto-populate all these fields. Um, but otherwise, if you're just starting out with a totally new event, you can just start entering your data. So verbatim locality is it's info provided by the original collector. Typically, things like misspellings or outdated geopolitical units are preserved here. So I'm just going to say 
This was collected in the city near Boulder, Nilot. Uh, verbatim date, we'll just say January 1st, 2018. Um, and you can see I already used that copy to all features, so it's already populated there. Um, but we do have began and end date because they accommodate a range. So especially with legacy collections, you see a lot of vague dates such as like spring 1904 or just the year. Um, so you can format that as an ISO date so that the range becomes searchable. So you'd enter something like April through June 1904, whatever boundaries you determine um, for some of those vague dates. Uh, event remark. Um, any pertinent remarks? I often use this field for legacy specimens that don't have a collect date. So I'll annotate that began and end date were based on collector birth and death dates or when the specimen was accessioned to sort of better anchor the specimen in time. Um, next we have higher geography, uh, which is also controlled. It, it accepts essentially anything above city level locality information. So you can just type, type um, the smallest administrative unit. So this part is from Boulder County. So I'll just push tab and you can see it comes up as the only Boulder County and click and populate. Um, and you can see that, you know, on when I did that search, there's all sorts of administrative units, islands, water bodies, features, mountain ranges. Um, so nearly all global administrative units are available in higher geography. Um, but, you know, if there's a remote island group or feature not listed, you, you can request that it be added. Um, again, you can do a locality nickname or pick an existing specific locality, um, similar to collecting event. If there's one you'd like to clone. Um, and so this ensures your record will be batched with other records in the database and not generate, you know, a second near match locality because you forgot to enter, you know, a comma or exactly match an existing locality string. Um, otherwise, you'll just enter your specific locality info. Ooh, my screen is doing something a little odd here. <laughs> there we go. Um, elevation. You can enter as a range, um, so if you have that information, enter it here. I can shoot this little arrow if it's just one number. Um, depth, I don't know why this <laughs> name is coming up. There we go. There we go. Um, depth is the same thing if you have depth data. Um, remarks, I can enter any further remarks regarding locality. Uh, well-known text coordinates for geometries that outline a polygon. Um, if I have that information, I can enter that here, um, or I can go ahead and enter coordinates. Um, so again, not required, but um, if you do select, if you do have coordinate data and you select a value from this parent field, you will activate sort of all the child fields beneath it, um, which do then become required. Um, so I can enter, you know, maximum error. There's drop downs for datum, um, geo reference source, and protocol, and then actual fields for entering my coordinates. Um, and I can also use geolocate, which is embedded in Arctos. So if I just click here, it's actually going to pull from my higher geography and specific locality fields. So you can see the point centered on Niwa, and I can, you know, adjust this. Um, however I need to, and then I can just save these coordinates to my application. You can see all these fields are populated here. Um, <clears throat> this next block, specimen event, is um, essentially my name here as the event determiner. So that's the person asserting that the collecting event type, um, they're asserting this specimen event is of this type available in the drop down menu. So often this is the collector, but it could be the georeferencer or the collection manager who has verified the coordinates and dates and locality info. So in this case, since I used geolocate, it's actually um, populating it with my login name and I'm asserting the coordinate information and I did so today. Um, the event type. So here we have a few options and again, this is a good place to read um, more on the code tables, but accepted place of collection is essentially where the specimen was removed from the wild, 
versus an encounter might be um, typically just a biological sample was taken versus an observation um, where the individual was observed, so no sample was taken, but maybe it was a sighting or a camera trap um, or place of manufacture, place of use are usually associated with cultural items. Um, and then I can indicate the verification status, which again um, is something you can look up on the code tables, but essentially it indicates the degree to which the collecting event info has been vetted. So um, unverified means that really no one um, has done anything beyond transcribing the data in the data entry form, no critical evaluation method was applied, checked indicates someone has kind of looked over the values um, and everything sort of seems well aligned, um, whereas verified means that some amount of cross-checking against field notes or ledger or mapping has occurred and the information is believed to be accurate. And um, this actually locks the event, making it very difficult to edit in the future. Um, there's room for specimen remarks, um, specimen event remarks, and um, then just really generic specimen of remarks um, if they don't if you haven't found space in the above categories you can make further annotations here um, associated species is a free text field but you might enter specific species that were associated with a specimen um, especially if they weren't collected so for example the tree the bird um, you know the, the bird was found near or an ectoparasite that I found on its body that I didn't keep um, and then this field missing um, is a way to tag the record with a flag so that operators know that there may be outstanding data to add at a later date that might not be available at the moment. And that's just um, going to appear as, as text in your record. Um, so last thing I'll do is save my record. Um, and let's see if I missed any fields. So I actually, um, if, I, if I hadn't, um, you know, if I had forgotten to to enter information into a yellow field, I'd actually get like a little error message um, that tells me, you know, attribute one is missing for a determiner or something like that. Um, but I know that this successfully saved because you can see all my data has disappeared. I didn't carry over anything. Um, so that is good. And um, I the last thing that we'll do, so the record isn't actually saved um, it's not automatically loaded to the front end upon saving. Um, it's not available online quite yet. So I'll actually have to just check one last um, process. So I'm going to click on this Ajax grid here, and it's going to take me to a flat table where my record is sitting. Um, so I'm in this flat table. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can kind of get a better view. And I'm going to navigate to the record that I just entered. You can see I have other records in here. Um, so you can see here's my record waiting approval. And it's just, you know, a flat file with all the information I just added. Um, so I can, I can basically do any sort of editing I want to do. So say I realize my date is incorrect, I can edit that here and a little red flag will appear in the corner of the cell to show me that I've altered that information. Um, but essentially, once I, once I find that my record is, you know, seems to be accurate and the information um, that I want is, is in there, I can click this Mark All to Load hypertext. Um, and that's going to push my record through one more vetting process to make sure, you know, all my information um, is cross-referenced with all of those controlled tables, all my dates are formatted correctly, et cetera. Um, and once it passes through that final check, um, it will be loaded to the public-facing interface. Um, any error messages will return in this loaded column. And um, you probably saw there I had some error messages, and that refers to um, sort of some of my existing records that have these um, suffix um, suffixes at the end of my catalog numbers, which my collection, I've, I've said that I only want integer values, so that's why those are being flagged as an error. Um, but so typically, once I mark all the load, I can view my records within a couple minutes. Um, again, any errors detected will return in the loaded column. 
um, and I can just go ahead and fix and, and reload as many times as necessary. Um, I can also access this table through the um, browse and edit uh, list. So if I go to enter data, bulk loader, browse and edit, um, I, here I can also get to my table. Um, but I can also perform quality checks on other users' works before giving the green light to load. So I can click on a student operator's name and view their flat table. And I can see the student's records are awaiting my approval. Um, and I can go ahead and mark all to load um, once I check through and, and they look accurate. So um, yeah, so that's the final step essentially before loading data to the public facing um, view. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and transition to bulk loading now. Um, and we'll get to, to questions you have on the data entry screen um, in, in the end. But now you, you essentially have the foundations to bulk load specimen data. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll use this feature for loading large data sets or already prepared spreadsheets. Um, so how you do that actually is you'll go to enter data, um, bulk loader, bulk load specimens. And this is the page where you ultimately load your prepared spreadsheet of specimen data. And so the bulk loader can handle several thousand records at once. Um, but if you do have a really large data set, meaning like tens of thousands of records, it's often easier to load in batches for smoother handling, especially if there's a lot of complexity to your data. Um, so in order to prepare your spreadsheet, you'll use the bulk loader builder feature to customize your spreadsheet template. Um, so essentially here you can basically toggle different groups of fields on or off depending on what you need um, for your specific data set. And these all correspond directly to the fields from your data entry screen. Um, so um, I can just download this template from here. I often just download everything and then delete the columns that I don't end up using. Um, another tip once you get this template is just immediately save it as an XLS file and not a CSV until you're actually ready to load. Um, otherwise, Excel will reformat your dates if you end up closing and opening the CSV to work on it later. A um, couple other basic things is you can rearrange the columns manually um, you know, to fit your workflow if you don't like this default order. You can also get rid of any columns that you don't need as long as they're not required. Um, so for instance, you can see if I keep scrolling, um, you know, there's up to 10, there's 10 fields for collector, for 10 parts, 10 attributes. So you'll likely delete many of these extra columns. Um, I also want to note that I often find I reuse my template after successfully loading a batch of data, but Keep in mind that new fields and capabilities are added to Arctos constantly, so a template might get stale after a year or so. So it's most reliable to just use that bulk loader builder feature every time you're loading a new data set rather than copying and pasting a version that you may have saved on your computer. Um, so here's an example um, bulk load spreadsheet of data that I have ready to load into Arctos. Um, so you can see the spreadsheet contains every field in the data entry form, so it should look pretty familiar. Um, the only different columns that you'll see in the spreadsheet are this loaded column, um, which you'll leave blank. So this is that column that returns any error messages when you load the sheet. Um, there's another column, collection object ID, um, which you'll just enumerate, and it's only needed temporarily by the application to load your data set, and um, it won't appear in your specimen record. Um, there's entered by which requires just your login, um, and then the GUID for your collection. So you can see here, this is a HERP um, data sheet I'm, I'm loading. Um, so while you're formatting your spreadsheet, it's really helpful to have the data entry screen open um, at the same time, um, so that while you do so, you can sort of access all those drop-down menus easily um, and pick lists to ensure that you're entering the correct values into the spreadsheet. Um, so for example, I can just quickly look up an agent name to see how it's formatted or spelled. Um, I can check, you know, oh, how, are, how do I need to, um, you know, format 
coordinate units, oh, it's deg, min, sec, not degrees, minutes, seconds, things like that. Um, or I can see what my attribute options are. Um, it's important that you enter these values exactly as they're formatted in the data entry screen, or you will get errors when you try to load your spreadsheet. The bulk loader is case sensitive, which you'll want to watch out for things like capitalization, misspellings, leading and trailing spaces. Um, the data entry screen will also remind operators which fields are required um, and that must be included in your bulk loaders to successfully upload your data. So beyond obvious required fields, there are those you might not necessarily have data for, um, but we're leaving the field null is not an option. So for instance, sex, um, even if you don't have a value, you still might have to record unknown um, or record it as unknown. Um, a couple more tips is that um, all your dates will need to be in that ISO date format. So you can see here, um, let's see, mine are not currently. And there are a lot of ways to change this to that format. Um, I usually just do right click, format cells, custom, and then I just um, type it here and um, push OK, and that's going to convert them. Um, with any spreadsheet, just be careful of dragging down numbers and auto-incrementing them, especially for coordinates and dates. Um, one other thing is you can load mixed, you know, accession numbers and also, um, and also uh, collection types. So I, I, I could actually be loading a mixed batch of herps and birds, um, whatever. Uh, another thing to watch out is just make sure to use um, HTML codes for things like Accent marks, ampersands, and degree signs, they don't really handle well um, the symbols when they, when they go to load. Um, and you'll just want to make sure your spreadsheet in general is nice and clean. Um, as I, you know, many people might be aware, Excel does tend to add um, hidden characters and um, empty rows beneath data sets. Um, so you just want to Make sure that you're sort of double checking your spreadsheet, um, making sure your data is fully normalized. And um, Erica mentioned that the next Arctos webinar, um, she and Andy Dole will give you a lot of insight into tools that can clean your data to assist preparation. Um, but however, that being said, the bulk loader will also detect formatting issues and point out these errors. So you can just attempt to push your data in without a really thorough vetting. Um, just to get an initial error report and make necessary corrections in your spreadsheet and reload it. Um, but to get to this first checkpoint, you do have to at least have a properly formatted template with um, you know, clean column headers to successfully load your spreadsheet. Um, all right, so the last thing you'll do before you load your data is um, delete any unused columns and um, save as a CSV. Um, you'll go to that bulk loading screen um, to upload your file. So I'll just find my file um, and I'll upload. Um, although at this point you might get an error. So I, I just took a picture um, of a common error message you might see. Um, and this just essentially means something is wrong with your basic template. It can result from not having all those the required columns or a misspelled or duplicate column name. Um, so that's a good time to check your columns against the bulk loader building, builder template if you're working from an older version to make sure you're up to date. Um, it may also result from having an extra blank row at the end of your data set, which Excel often adds. So I usually pass my spreadsheet through a text editor, editor just like Notepad or um, Sublime Text. So you can see here if I just open my file um, in Notepad, if I click here, you see, oh, there's an extra line. I just delete it um, and then save and then load um, from there. So that's really kind of the number one reason that you might see this error. Um, otherwise, I've, I've pushed load. And you can see um, there are 78 records in the staging table. They have not been checked or processed yet. So there's a few options. Um, check and load these records which will take you to a table that points out any errors contained in your data set and gives you some cleanup options. Um, just load these records, pushes them directly into that browse and edit bulk loader table. Um, so from there, I would have to 
actually mark my records to load in order to see what errors emerge. Um, I don't really recommend doing clicking on this option if you don't have a sense of how error laden your data is, because um, you might have to manually edit like 50 records in that flat table. Um, push to pre bulk loader is in beta, but essentially um, you would use this data, you would use this feature to um, to examine really large data sets and perform specific lookups and cross checks um, and cleanup takes you to a cleanup home page um, where there are several useful tools, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to check and load these records. Um, and I can see four of 78 records will not successfully load. Um, so I've planted a few errors to show you how to address them. So you'll have two options. I can download my data with errors, um, which will give me a CSV with that loaded column full of messages pointing out those four faulty values. Um, and this is a really good first step, especially if you have a lot of errors. You might actually get 78 out of 78 won't load. Um, but since I don't have too many errors, I'm just going to fix um, directly with my Arctos tools. Um, if I did actually have to go into my spreadsheet and fix you know, 78 errors, um, I can just reload that um, over and over, and it will just keep overwriting um, with the freshest version. So I'm going to click here, and this takes me to the cleanup home page. Um, and there are a few options, but essentially, um, you know, if you do have a spreadsheet full of, you know, leading and trailing um, spaces and um, sort of lots of formatting errors, you can actually um, click this strip junk link, and that's going to kind of clean those out. Otherwise, I'm just going to go to my grid and directly edit any errors. Um, so I will make this a little bigger. Um, so I'm going to expand this loaded column and sort, and I can see what, what's happening here. So I can see a few things. Oh, um, attribute determiner doesn't match any agents. So I can just go ahead and um, you know, scroll into this loader and fix, um, you know, look for the error and, and fix it directly in the sheet, just like I did before. So catalog number is invalid. It's a duplicate, and I can see I forgot a one here. I didn't enter um, enter by. So yeah, I, can, you know, I can just go ahead and um, fix whatever issues are pointed out here. So I can see, oh, Harry Taylor isn't matching um, an existing agent profile. And I know, um, I just know that it's actually formatted in Arctos as Harry L. Taylor, so I'll have to go in um, and add that L. So just little things there, and then I can go ahead and proceed um, to my browse and edit. Or I can go ahead and, sorry, um, I can go ahead and fix those, and then um, they'll be pushed to my browse and edit screen. Um, and I can mark all to load as previously demonstrated um, once I refresh. <clears throat> so if I go to cleanup home, um, you know, I can just kind of navigate back and forth um, and push, sorry, a little. Um, then I can, sorry, go ahead and um, just load the records, and that will push them to the Browse and Edit screen. Um, so essentially, then I'll go to Browse and Edit. I'll do the Mark All to Load, and then um, load my records. Um, again, anything that's not successful, I'll still get the errors returned. Um, but anything successfully loaded will be available online within minutes. Um, you'll then want to delete your records from the staging table. So let me just go here again. Um, you'll get a lot of reminders kind of throughout the process, but um, essentially you can see right now, let's see, I'm, there's a timestamp. So it shows that I'm using the staging table, um, so no one else can kind of use it at the same time. So if you're in here for a while, you might get an email from someone asking, like, are you still using the staging table, or um, did you just forget to delete your records from there? So once I know my records are in my browse and edit table, I can just go ahead and delete like so. Um, and then I will be out of there. Um, so last things before questions. Um, 
there, this is a lot of information I've covered. So um, a lot of this info is summarized in the Arctos handbook, um, which you can go to here, handbook arctos.db.org, where you can find a lot of how-tos um, and documentation on many different Arctos topics. Um, Erica and Andy next webinar will also sort of cover this um, in more detail. Um, but I did want to point out there is a really good how-to on a bridged bulk loader template um, called How to Enter Specimens in the Field. Um, that's really good to give to students or collectors before they head out um, so that they can prepare their data for Arctos so you only have to modify it a bit. Um, and I also just wanted to add that now you're familiar with sort of the basic process of um, bulk loading. There are many types of bulk loaders. Um, that you can um, use in Arctos beyond just loading specimen records. So for instance, once your Ar records are already loaded in Arctos, you can append related data to records via spreadsheets, so like publications or object tracking locations or media that you want to connect to your records. Um, and all the bulk loaders sort of operate in a similar manner to the specimen bulk loader. Um, so they'll each have you know, a template with required fields um, and it will tell you, you know, suggested values. And it's a really useful way to push large amounts of data into the application. Um, so I'll stop there, and we can, um, we can go over questions if, if folks have some questions. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a really impressive amount of information covered in a very short amount of time. Um, I did turn on everybody's microphone, so you might need to click the little microphone icon in the top bar to be green. But if you would like to speak, you can. Um, otherwise, go ahead and type your questions in the chat. I'm sure there will be lots of lots of questions because <laughs> Emily just opened up a can of worms into a whole bunch of other things in Arctos. But I think that was very helpful, as as Dustin is saying in the chat. And just so you, um, or go ahead. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, one is. Once you've entered these records, they're available to you right away, but they're not necessarily available on the public site for maybe up to 24 hours. So sometimes you, um, if you're entering things and you want someone else to see them, they probably can't see them right away um, unless they have access to your collection. That is helpful to note. So like Emily was saying, that after you mark something to load in the Browse and Edit interface, it is available to you within minutes. But like Teresa says, if you're trying to share that data with a, a donor or a researcher, it might not be available for 24 hours. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the other thing is um, the downloaded with errors file. If you do that, if you download that CSV, um, it's going to change all of your date formats. So you can definitely use that file, but you'll have to reformat all your dates before you try to upload it again. Yeah, and I, I typically just, um, when I do the download with errors, I, I typically just look at the error column and then just work from my original CSV just to prevent sort of any of that auto formatting from happening. Right, that's exactly what I do. Um, either that or I will just screenshot the um, AJAX grid um, so I can see the errors and then I'll get my data out of there so other people can use the bulk loader. That brings up a really good point that I want to stress just for everybody in the audience who's a current Arctos user is when, and Emily did mention this, but when you are using the bulk loader, nobody else can be. So it, it is really important that if you're not able to fix and push your specimens into your browse and edit interface within a timely manner that you you just download them with the errors for later because otherwise you are um, holding holding other people up. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll give it a, a few more minutes for questions. I think everyone's maybe just stunned and overwhelmed at this point, Emily. We did have a lot of um, good discussion <laughs> while, while you were talking. Um, and I'll just remind everyone, once again, please, please, please take the post-webinar survey. Uh, if you appreciate not having to register for things like this and being able to show up last minute, um, 
spend a minute answering a few multiple choice questions. You don't even have to put anything into the free text fields of the post webinar survey. Just go and enter your demographic information. And Dustin, like Teresa is saying, yes, so across all institutions, only one user can be using the bulk loader at once. <laughs> 